Hey, what's up guys? I'm Matt Wright. I have little to no respect for anybody who wakes up every day and makes the decision to live with a victim's negative mentality. Most dudes that look like that are not that funny. I mean, people don't want to laugh at like physically attractive people. Like you don't want to walk on stage and have people looking at your arms other than listening to your jokes. I know who I am. I start gaslighting myself. I'm literally like, maybe it wasn't as serious as I thought it was. He's telling me, you're the only girl I want. I don't think I was delusional. I know I'm not racist. Look, you're mixed. I want to be black. This is just another white dude trying to get out of another sticky situation. I hate the internet. I really do. Sit at a home all day trying to cancel people. Matt right? I need to drag this man to hell and back. I don't think I've ever hated someone as much as I hate oh. Matt Right. Embarrassing is the best word to describe Matt Right. I also don't have to convince you of a single fucking thing. Ah, uh, Matthew Stephen Reif, the heartthrob who, wait, haven't we heard this somewhere before? Check it out. There's this guy, Matt Reif. He's conventionally attractive, and he built up an empire around that. With the world at his fingertips, Matt was set to be the next big thing in comedy. He had Vogue writing up articles about him, saying things like, he honestly looks like an AI-generated teen idol. The pre-sale tickets to his world tour this past summer broke Ticketmaster, just like Taylor Swift and Beyonce have done. He had a long, successful career ahead of him, only to squash it in its infancy. For some reason, it comes down to this. If you're a naturally funny person and a talented comedian, you don't need to rely on vulgarity, dark humor, and seeing how many people you can offend without sparking widespread outrage. Not that vulgarity and dark humor is bad, but very few people can do it as well as Bob Saget. Rest in peace, boo -boo. After researching Matt Reif for this video, and unfortunately watching all of his hour-long specials, I realized something. Matt's comedy is entirely made up of punching down on marginalized groups. And then about 20 minutes of each set is dedicated to him defending himself, trying to convince the audience that he is hilarious, but we're all just overly sensitive, refusing to take responsibility for the unfunny shit he says, and then claiming he wants to make people laugh and be happy. I cannot fathom a reality where people can talk to you as disrespectful as they want without facing any physical consequences. I, I know as, as a public figure, I'm supposed to be like the big person and take the high road but fucking Dude. Maybe Gen Z thinks this stuff is funny. Maybe my millennial ass is just too old to get it. Well, back in my day, the funniest comedians were people who could laugh at themselves. Matt does not do that in his prepared routines. The closest thing we see is him saying how hard it is to be good looking. It's not only unfunny, but also unrelatable. And I'll admit, I actually followed Matt Rife for a minute there. I thought his crowd work was pretty funny, and his quick wit is impressive. I will give him that. His crowd work actually is quite funny, in my opinion. If this is the only view you have of him, which is basically all I had, you'd see a handsome, charming, charismatic guy who can make any situation funny just in the way he communicates with his audience. These clips, however, only show a glimpse into Matt. I can imagine that if he tried to build his huge social media presence on the actual contents of his stand-up routines, he wouldn't have blown up the way he has because his actual prepared routines are not funny funny, and we'll get into all of that. Some of the things he tries to joke about can get dark, and with no humor to back it up, it might lead you to needing to take some self-care breaks just to escape this subject matter. Thankfully, if you need to take a few minutes to yourself while watching this video, you may be able to find some help with that through the sponsor of today's video, June's Journey. Set in the glamorous 1920s, June's Journey is a free-to-download hidden object game that follows Detective June Parker through a thrilling story where she not only tries to solve the murder of her sister, but also uncovers her family's secrets along the way. The game is visually stunning, the music is relaxing, and the gameplay is a perfect way to help yourself unwind at the end of the day. I almost always end my nights by playing puzzle games in bed because that's just what helps my brain wind down. I like that June's Journey is one of those games that immerses you in a different world where the events of the day just melt away as you look at a beautiful and thoughtful picture and tap on the hidden objects. And then you can earn points and you can use those points to decorate this pretty estate. And you can fix it up and buy decorations and place them wherever you want to your heart's desire. I had the bright idea of building a little moat around the property. And I'm thinking maybe in the future, I'm gonna turn like this little area into like 
just a nice little garden. Download June's Journey for free by clicking the link below in the description or scanning the QR code on screen. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Trust me, you might want it while we learn about Matt Rife and what led him to the place he finds himself in today. At the time of this video's creation, Matt Reif is 28 years old. He was born and raised in Ohio as the only son in a home full of girls. With three stepsisters and one half-sister, it seems very strange that Matt is so hostile towards women in his comedy. That hostility is something we'll examine soon too. I just thought that this was interesting. What went so wrong for Matt? If anything, he should have a serious respect for women having been raised in the family that he was. He's it's like, like Matt Reif who yeah. blows up with yeah. TikTok. Who I had Someone. featuring for me. Matt saw me when he was 15. I yeah. did an arena gig in his town yeah. and he reached out and was like, I want to be a comedian. I said, okay, well, when you graduate high school, come to the Laugh Factory and we'll shoot the shit. That's somebody who put in the work on their own. We all could say, oh, I helped give him gigs, but the reality is he did it. And I will say, after researching him, I was kind of stunned to realize that Matt's career didn't actually start with a viral post on TikTok. Matt has been performing since he was in high school, and back then he wasn't the buff model-esque guy with good teeth that we know him as today. He was a scrawny kid who couldn't rely on his looks to get ahead. Not that he was ugly or anything, but he was just an awkward kid like we all were in high school. Our next right now coming to you is 17 years old. He is from Columbus, Ohio, and his name is Matt Rice. Do I believe that he put in the work in the beginning? Yeah, I think so. You can say his material from this time was pretty cringe, but for a 17-year-old kid, especially being presented to us out of the context of who he is today, I feel like we'd all be like, yeah, you go, little guy, you're gonna do great things. Matt appeared as a reoccurring cast member on the hit comedy improv show Wild and Out between 2015 and 2017, when Matt was just 19 years old. Going from small five-minute sets in Ohio to an extremely successful TV show being seen by a national audience is a big achievement for anyone, let alone a teenager. But this is also when what I would say is his first controversy happened. In an episode of the show early in his run, they were playing a game called Talk and Spit, where they have a celebrity guest put water in their mouth and then the comedians have to try to make them laugh. The celebrity guest in this instance was Zendaya, who was 18 at the time. When it came to Matt's turn, first of all, the way he squeaks his little sneakers up at first, I thought was really funny. Probably the funniest thing he's ever done on Wild and Out, but the rest of it is yikes. Let's just watch. Hey Zendaya, I'm Nick Cannon. Eh, nah, f that. Uh, I'm Matt mother right, all right? Look, you're mixed, I wanna be black. Let's make a lifestyle move. Spit that water out so I can get your number, please. <laughs> I mean, first of all, what even was that joke? Most people who were critical of this moment can't agree that there was nothing funny about that. It didn't even make sense. But in case you weren't sure, yeah, the main controversy lies in the fact that Matt touched her face, obviously without consent because she had water in her mouth and couldn't say no without losing the game for her team, and I think she's a good sport. I think it goes without saying that this kind of physical contact is a no-go in situations like this. She obviously handled it with Grace, giving him the little finger wag, and the rest of the cast stood up for Zendaya as Matt responds with, I didn't touch her. Bro, yes you did though, we all saw you. touching on her like that. That was definitely a bomb. Not only a bomb for the audience, but everybody on the cast was like, whoa, chill, man. It was over. I'm like, man, uh-uh. You're not about to do that. That girl got a job on the Disney Channel. First of all, y'all acting like I harassed this woman and she didn't ask for it by looking me straight in my soul, okay? Just because I caress a woman's face, everybody's just gonna freak out. What follows does keep with the comedic theme and they hilariously roast Matt in the process, but this moment was uncomfortable for everyone involved. So, he got acne and his fingernails dirty. <laughs> To make things even worse for himself, Matt made this post on Instagram when the episode was set to air, as if he was bragging about it. 
He captioned the photo with, Watch me get in Zendaya's personal space tonight on Wild and Out. This incident started making its rounds on social media in recent weeks, since the conversation about how terrible Matt Rife is, is still fresh in everyone's mind at this point. One Twitter user wrote, Had I known Matt Rife was the same guy on Wild and Out that touched Zendaya's face, I would have instantly hated him. Another wrote, Totally forgot Matt Rife was on Wild and Out and made the weird comments to Zendaya. It's all starting to make sense now. And many others joined in on the conversation to say, I knew Matt Rife sucked before the rest of you, basically. This instance is one that makes everyone who watches it feel secondhand embarrassment for Matt. So I'm sorry for making you feel that here, but come on, you don't lay a finger on Zendaya like that, dude. There's a 15 minute compilation on YouTube of Matt's greatest moments on Wild and Out. Maybe I just don't get it, but I didn't laugh once. The whole joke is that he's kind of the token white boy, which is funny when he's the butt of everyone else's jokes, but the actual comedy he tries to spit out is hardly worth a smirk. That's obviously just my opinion, but watch it for yourself. Like, you could legitimately do a try to laugh challenge with that video, I'm telling you. <laughs> that sucks! <laughs> In 2016, Matt Reif came face to face with cancel culture for pretty much the first time, I would say, after a series of his old tweets from back in 2012 were unearthed following a ridiculous Twitter feud with another comedian named Brandon Wardell. It all started when Brandon posted two screenshots from Matt's Instagram and started poking fun at him. While the original tweets have been deleted and it's hard to say which pictures he was posting, captions he posted still exist and he said, "Imagine." posting this, look at these hashtags, and this guy is a stand-up comedian, LMAO. I'll admit it's pretty shitty of him to just make posts like this for the sole purpose of instigating a fight and evoking a response from Matt, but welcome to the internet. That's what happens when you're a public figure. People get gratification from you responding to them in any way, whether it's positive or negative. They just want your attention. Matt should know this by now. And at first, Matt's only response to Brandon was to go private on Twitter and Instagram, presumably because he was getting flooded with comments that were less than kind. He later went on to rant on Snapchat, but could only contain himself there for so long. Eventually, he made his way back to Twitter. Unfortunately, all of the tweets between the two have been deleted, and I couldn't really find screenshots of any of them, but according to an article on SK Pop, they say the back and forth basically led Matt to challenging Brandon to a fight in a park and threatening that if he didn't show up, Matt would come to him. The article quotes one of Matt's tweets from the feud where he allegedly said, Jokes are supposed to be funny. You're a grown man. Don't ever fucking disrespect me. You don't know me, understand? You seem to be taking this a little too seriously, my guy. The article also says the following. Matt Reif even made fun of Wardell's comedian status and dared him to speak up publicly. Not only that, when Brandon made a fake apology for taking corny screenshots of his Instagram, mocking him for having more followers there for his looks rather than the app where you use words, Matt further retaliated by calling him a douche and saying, you're gonna publicly apologize. Backhanded compliments, big mistake. Damn, what a tough guy. This prompted Twitter to dig up some of his old tweets as Twitter does best. Was it right for Brandon to poke fun at Matt? Literally for no reason? No, I don't think so. But am I glad it happened because we got to see these tweets? Hell yeah. I mean, as if his terribly defensive responses to Brandon weren't enough of a red flag exposing Matt as a sad, insecure little boy, but these tweets definitely added fuel to the fire. And as they began to be made public, Matt went on a tweet deleting spree. Thankfully, some people did take screenshots of these tweets before he deleted them, and there are probably more that Matt managed to get to before anyone else did. I can't even read these tweets out loud, they're very vulgar, but I'll put them on the screen here, censored of course, because YouTube. You can read them for yourself. And okay, okay, listen, some of these tweets were dated back Back to 2011 and 2012, where Matt was barely 15 years old, and we've all said and done some dumb shit when we were 15 years old, and if you say you haven't, then you're just a damn liar. Bestie, be real. <laughs> 
Young people have a way of rebelling by way of shock value, and I don't think it's fair to hold it against a person forever if they've been given time to realize how awful those things were when they said them. Matt actually addressed the situation in one of his stand-up specials in 2021 that he called OnlyFans. While I feel like a lot of this makes sense and should be given grace because, again, he was 15, Matt admits that he was ignorant, and again, we all were at 15. All of that being said, though, why address this in a stand-up show five years later? later. And the roughest part is, this takes up the entirety of the last 10 minutes of his set. Like, they're fucking mine. If you or anybody watching were to take the slightest glimpse into my life, you wouldn't have to look far at all. You would see that all of my friends are black. To summarize, he pulls the whole I have a black friend card and tries desperately to make us all believe that he's not racist. And I personally do believe that he doesn't think he's racist. I'm sure he doesn't mean harm by the way that he appropriates black culture literally all the time. But holy shit, dude, it's like when a murderer is being questioned by police and they throw in a ton of extra details to sound like they totally didn't do it, but that just makes them look even more suspicious. When I'm faced with with whether or not I should accept an apology from somebody. All I really want is acknowledgement that they did something wrong, which Matt did. The explanation of I was young and ignorant, in my opinion, in situations like these, I think it's a valid excuse if that person has proven that they have taken that experience, learned from it, and changed. Like, prove to me that you'll never do that again, right? Most people learn and grow a lot between the ages of 15 and 25, or however old he was at the time. And I think it's important to give people the chance to change. And then just, like, leave it there. We don't need a 10-minute explanation, dude. So, like, if this had just been a one-off thing, it'd probably be easy to shrug it off, like, oh, he was just a kid, let's let him learn and grow. The problem here is that, personally, I see no evidence of change. In an interview with Very Good Light in 2017, he rehashed the situation and responded to critics of his who said that he's racist and homophobic. He said, Those are the dumbest things I've ever heard. Racist? That absolutely makes no possible sense. I have a black roommate. <laughs> Sorry. I'm on the blackest TV show of all time. All my co-stars are black. And homophobic? At 15, I maybe was. I lived in a small town of 4,000 people. Now, living in LA, some of my best friends are gay. Also, this is off topic, but there's another quote by him in the same article that I didn't know where else to put in this video, but it's wild. So Matt mentions he hates social media, which he has said a bazillion times. I hate the internet, I really do. Social media especially, I can't stand social media. We get it, Matt. You don't like to be held accountable. He says he hates that it's a game he has to play, and then when he's confronted about how his social media presence at the time just relied on thirst traps, he responded by saying, my shirtless photos are because a lot of my fans are like 12 to 20-ish. You have to know your crowd and have to play with them. I'm sorry, um, Matt? Did you just admit that you are purposely targeting 12-year-old children with your shirtless pics? There is so much to unpack here. If you're trying to be a comedian, but your comedy only attracts 12-year-olds, maybe you need to switch up your content, my guy. The shit that 12-year-olds think is funny is like objectively not funny. I think the rest of society has kind of deemed that to be a true statement. But sir, you are admitting to thirst trapping 12 year olds on purpose, bro. That is disgusting. I don't know why I've never seen anyone else talk about this, but when I read this, my unchiseled jaw hit the floor. <laughs> the initial tweet unearthing came up in 2016, but that wasn't the end of Matt's problematic Twitter history. If he had learned from his past mistakes, the conversation would probably end here for most of us, but he didn't. And why would he? His career was doing better than ever. People were casting him. He was, by most people's definition, successful, despite his severe shortcomings. In 2020, he fell under fire again while watching the Oscars. He thought it'd be a good idea to tweet, everyone at the Oscars watching to see if the cast of Parasite coughs. This was in February of 2020, basically right as the coronavirus outbreak hit the ground running in the United States. The severity of this virus was something that none of us could have ever imagined in early 2020. But still, this tweet was a racist jab at Asians because, well, the cast of the movie in question was Asian. 
I mean, they were Korean and COVID originated in China, but oh well, Matt, leave a comment on this video and tell me that my mom buys presents for me using OnlyFans money. When this tweet faced backlash, he doubled down. I posted a joke on here and on my Instagram story and the reactions were astoundingly different. <laughs> Just goes to show that this is the worst social media platform. Bunch of crybabies. Tell us how insecure you are, Matt. Your tears taste delicious. He continued to respond to tweets criticizing him, claiming that these people are being too sensitive over something that does not matter. He would obviously come to eat those words a few weeks later when the world shut down and millions of people would begin to perish and half of the United States would begin to blame Asian people for it and some would commit acts of violence against them as if any of them had anything to do with it. But all right, yeah, totally doesn't matter. Despite how close Matt came to meeting his demise via cancel culture in 2016, that didn't stop him from continuing to climb through the ranks of Hollywood. In 2017, he was cast as one of the hosts of the reboot of TRL, Total Request Live, which was a flop. Basically, MTV tried to reboot the show without it having anything to do with music videos and having everything to do with, like, YouTube. I wish I was kidding. They even let Gabby Hanna host the show for a minute. But he made other TV appearances on shows like Brooklyn Nine nine and fresh off the boat. I've dumped 14 boyfriends this year. Hey, babe, you wanted to talk? Time to make it 15. Let's do this in the garage. Hmm? Okay, the garage. That last one was before he made the racist tweet about Asians. He also competed in a season of the challenge, Champs vs. Stars. I have never actually watched the challenge, which surprises even me, being a huge fan of Big Brother and Survivor. So, okay, I used the scripting of this video as an excuse to binge watch the season, okay? Here's what I have to say about it. He competed against a former WWE diva, freaking Lil Romeo, remember that guy? He's all grown up now. An NFL player, Olympic medalists, UFC fighters, and various different reality TV stars. Each competitor chose a charity to compete to win money for. Matt chose the World Wildlife Foundation. It's kind of weird though, because he's portrayed as very quiet and serious. Like you'd expect him to be all loud and cocky, but he's kind of mousy in his edit for the show. He volunteers to go into the first elimination challenge at the dismay of his teammates because he wanted to prove he's more than just a comedian. Little grown up Romeo gets all mad at Matt for trying to cause a divide within their team because half the team wanted to send Riff Raff into the elimination challenge, but Matt was starting off the season as overly confident, so they're like, okay, fine, go. And luckily for Matt, the other guy sucked just a little bit more, so Matt got to stay. Basically, none of the drama in the middle of the season had anything to do with Matt. You almost forgot he was even there most of the time until towards the end of the season where Matt went against his alliance and pissed everyone off, including this red-haired chick that he was on Wild and Out with. Everyone called him a conniving floater who isn't loyal to anyone one by himself and then he was eliminated right before the finals where he got his ass handed to him by a girl i mean he made it kind of far but he didn't raise any money for his charity i don't know i found no excitement watching him play in the challenge and i don't know if this is normal on the challenge but in the episode before the finals they eliminated six people which is like stupid and pointless why cast this many people if you're gonna have to cut six of them at the end matt was one of those people if they hadn't done that how much longer would matt have lasted I mean, probably not long because everyone hated him at the end, but still, I feel like watching that show was a waste of my time. The challenge was not the only reality TV competition he competed in, though. He was on the first and so far only season of NBC's Bring the Funny, which aired in 2019. Matt's entire persona on the show is literally, every single time he shows up, hitting on Chrissy Teigen, who is the female judge on the panel. Like, Chrissy, I get it. I look like the kind of guy who would sleep with you and not call you the next day. But Chrissy, you know what I hate? I hate that you're not completely wrong. Like, I do suck at relationships. I'm so bad. I, uh, I'm dating right now because Chrissy doesn't know what she's doing with her life. <laughs> Chrissy, do you know what your sign is? There's a few things I want to change for the next round, but one thing I'm definitely keeping is a seduction of Chrissy. It's tiresome, dude. He made it to the semifinals, which is impressive considering his entire shtick was hitting on a woman who continually denied his advances, but I guess that's what mainstream network TV thinks is funny these days. For a few years, Matt Reif would continue to be cast in various TV shows and small roles in movies. In 2021, he released the previously mentioned Our 
hour-long special to YouTube called OnlyFans. In 2023, he came out with his second hour-long special called Matthew Stephen Rife. For the record, I watched both of them and they're meh, unrelatable humor to me. Maybe people who are young, good-looking, and in the dating game would find these specials funny, but I'm a frumpy old mother of two who's been married for nearly 12 years, so who am I to judge humor that I don't relate to at all? Also, I don't think school shootings are funny in any conceivable way, but he manages to make an entire segment about them in one of his specials. But anyway, by most people's definition, Matt was successful. He was climbing the ladder. He was paying his dues. He was making it. But if you ask him, he'd still say that he was struggling. Until TikTok. So Matt would begin posting short clips of his crowd work on TikTok. He'd get a few hundred thousand views per clip, which, I mean, any content creator would be happy with numbers like those just for the mere purpose of exposure, but that wasn't good enough for Matt. On July 30th, 2022, Matt would post a clip to TikTok the same way he normally did, only this time, 20 million views overnight. Today, this video has over 40 million views, and that's where Matt says things finally began to change for him. One clip just blew up everything. It was so weird. It was one clip. Yeah, a video I thought was stupid and didn't want to post anyways. I was like, this isn't even funny. I was at dinner with Paul Elia at uh, yeah, yeah, Paul. Up, in, up in Montreal in July. We were at dinner together, and I was like, oh, I edited this clip, and I, I bought the camera equipment. I learned how to edit, and this is this whole exhausting process. I'm like, it's yeah, I'm getting a couple hundred thousand views a video, but it's not changing anything. Thing. And he was like, just post it, just to have posted something. And I was like, ah, fine. And it did like 20 million views like overnight, basically. What? And it made every other clip that was on my profile do millions of views. And then it just became this chain reaction, it was just like an influx of people coming to my page. And now every video does between like five and 40 million views. It's what the f Suddenly Matt would be getting millions of views daily for his quick wit and his crowd work. He even came out with an entire special made up only of crowd work. It's clear that Matt's affinity for improvisational work like this comes from his time on Wild and Out, which is entirely made up of improv. He had real world practice in this area and he excelled. In 2023, at the height of his newfound fame, he would announce his worldwide tour called Problematic. Problematic get it? And would sell 600,000 tickets in the first two days. And this is around the time I had first ever heard of Matt. Acquaintances that I knew were posting all over social media about how stoked they were to have scored tickets to go see Matt Rife. And I was like, who the hell is Matt Rife? I mean, it was even to the point where I saw his name popping up while I was researching certain MLM distributors and they were posting selfies at the Matt Rife show and swooning over him. What was the big deal? Oh. He's got a chin that rivals cleft the boy chin wonder. His jawline could then cut salami with ease. His cheekbones are raised to the heavens and those baby blues will break your heart. And he's funny? All right, I get it, I'm in. The night I first discovered him, I stayed up for hours watching through his crowd work clips. I was sleep deprived, but I couldn't put my phone down. If this dude's crowd work is this good, I can't imagine how funny his actual stand up is. And then like his stepdaughter like comes around the corner of the kitchen. Ron, I really need my permission slip sign to go on this field trip. So he's just like fucking, how bad do you want to go to the zoo? <laughs> she just starts sucking his because how else do you get to the zoo? Oh. Why would a guy go through all that trouble and pretend to be my friend just to sleep with me? I don't know. But I've done it Ew. so many times. <laughs> so many times. How do you think I got you, stupid? Ooh. What an uncomfortable time to be a straight white male. This guy can't be serious. We could never talk anything out. If there was ever a point that I needed to get across to her, I would just have to like f her in Morse code or something. What? <laughs> Sir. God, where do I start? Well, one good place would be that he's allegedly a joke thief. Remember how I mentioned he opened for Ralphie May early in his comedy career? Well, Ralphie actually passed away in 2017 from cardiac arrest while battling pneumonia. How long do you have to wait after a comedian dies to be able to steal their joke and pass it off as your own? Just wondering. X user at really though made this video compilation and I don't know how anyone can watch this and think that it's anything other than a blatant ripoff. So, I mean, if you haven't guessed, this joke is obnoxiously vulgar and has the potential to be extremely offensive to like 99% of people who watch it. Like, I don't even know why you would pick this joke to steal because of how terrible it is, but you've been warned. He wasn't somebody that, you know, we had to take great care with and kid gloves with. He was our buddy. He was our friend, you know? Every time he came out to play, no matter what game we were playing, we all switched to football because he had the helmet. And you wanted to have a class with Russ because he was hilarious. He would
God always replaces a negative with a positive. Anytime you see somebody who is born less fortunate in a certain aspect, you don't have to worry about that. God, God's going to bless them with, with an attribute, uh, a quality about themselves, and sometimes even a skill set. Kind of even that playing field a little bit. It's kind of cool to see the way that God always finds a way of evening things out. Uh, there was a kid, Alex, in our high school. Alex was the same age as me. We went to high school together, freshman year, had gym class together. He, he was special needs, and he he had uh, he he had a on him. I don't, I don't know how else to tell you all that. That boy was blessed, man. People felt sorry for him. I was like, nah, fuck that dude. He's been terrorizing against the locker room the whole semester, man. He goes all back up against the locker. She's like, God damn, Alex. And to this day, he's the nicest person I've ever met. I hope he's out there hurting somebody right now. I really do. <laughs> She needs I know, I told you that it was bad. But that's not the only time someone has accused Matt Reif of stealing a joke from them. The Bro Code Network podcast posted this mashup in June, claiming that Matt stole this joke from them about the grip you can get from hospital socks. Are you actively like a, a socks have to be off in bed person or are you like, you don't care? Not it's not a deal break. This actually is a great time to plug you guys on my Shark Tank idea. <laughs> because I've never said this before, and nobody fucking steal it. Cause like, I'm, I'm a sock guy. Like, I, I don't like my bare feet being out. I don't like, I don't like flip flops, so I am on your side of it. But I keep mine on. Nah, cause my girl jones me cause I'll keep my slides on sometimes. <laughs> and for a couple of reasons. One, my feet are cold. And two, I keep them on for traction. I like, <laughs> I like, yeah, I like the grip. Which is what brings me to my pitch to you guys. You guys know, you guys know hospital socks? You got have a hospital uh, socks on? Yeah. No, they have they're like, they're warm, they have like the rubber on the bottom, right? Oh, this guy's guy. own socks? Oh, this guy's I wanted to get my own, like, hospital socks with that rubber grip on the bottom. So that way you put them on right before you fuck and it gives you a good, a good really put in work. <laughs> you to work. This one gets plausible deniability from me because it really just doesn't seem like the most original joke ever. However, the podcast YouTube page has 658,000 subscribers, even though their actual podcast episodes only get a couple thousand views per episode. Their TikTok page has over 220,000 followers, but some of those clips have kind of gone viral. Some of them have millions of views. The one that this particular clip comes from currently sits at 87,000 views on TikTok which isn't nothing, but it's also like not viral. <laughs> Is it possible that Matt saw this clip and used the joke for himself? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. And there are some word for word similarities between the clips. I'll let you all be the judge of this one for yourselves. I just think personally that this is a coincidence though. If anything, it's proof that he has plenty of content that isn't clever or original. Accusations of joke theft aside, that's not my biggest problem with Matt's standup. And obviously joke theft is a big deal, but the bigger issue is exactly what I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Matt's comedy punches down on marginalized groups. He leans on the pretty boy stereotype and any attempts by him to be self-deprecating just come off as like, really bro? It's cool to poke fun at yourself. It's not cool to throw unfunny punches at people who are less fortunate than you for the sake of seeing how far you can push the line between what's funny and what's straight up offensive. And Matt finally pushed it too far, to the point where this face off with cancel culture will likely be difficult for him to come back from. In November of 2023, Matt would release another hour long comedy special. This time he was playing with the big boys. His new special called Natural Selection would be hosted on Netflix. And that's basically how you know you've made it as a comic. Netflix is is the big leagues and Matt Reif landed up there alongside the rest of the big players. He did the whole media tour and promoted his show on some of the big late night talk shows and national morning news shows. He was on top of the world until the special actually came out and the public was finally able to watch it for themselves. Having garnered 4.8 stars out of 10 on IMDb, and a pathetic 18% on Rotten Tomatoes, Natural Selection absolutely bombed with audiences everywhere. But why? What could he have possibly said that was that bad? Well, for starters, he opened with a joke that ultimately got this whole storm brewing in the first place. I'm sure you've seen the clip of the joke by now, but in case you haven't, here it is and also trigger warning for domestic abuse. I've only been to Baltimore one time. I ate lunch there and the hostess who like seats you at the restaurant had a black eye, a <laughs> full black eye. And it wasn't like, what happened? It was pretty obvious what happened. And we couldn't get over the fact that we were like, this is the face of the company. Like this is, this is where you have greeting people. And my boy who I was with was like, yeah, I feel bad for her, man. I feel like they should put her in the kitchen or something where nobody, where nobody has to see her face, you know? And I was like, yeah, but I feel like if she could cook, she wouldn't have that black eye. So. <laughs> 
Testing the water, seeing if y'all are gonna be fun or not. Just wanted to see. Just wanted to see. I figured we start the show with domestic violence. The rest of the show should be, should be pretty smooth sailing after that. Yeah, that's how he opened the show? I unfortunately watched the entire thing. <laughs> For the sake of research and for the sake of this video, you're welcome. Let me just sum up the entire thing for you. Lol, domestic violence. Crystal girls are smelly and crazy. This crystal shit is getting out of control. I wanna fuck old people. I would fuck a grandma in a heartbeat. I'm gonna have ugly kids because I have bad karma. Uh. Special needs kids are compensating for their shortcoming in their pants. <laughs> Trying to make school shootings funny for at least the second time in his career. Gay monsters coming out of the closet. Ah! ah! Peepee jokes, describing the plot of it to us as if none of us have ever heard of the Stephen King classic before. More peepee -pee jokes in the shower this time. Admitting that his audience is mostly women because no one is laughing at his peepee -pee jokes. I'm realizing right now I need more guy fans. If this room was 70% dudes the way it is women, this joke would have been like, ah! More peepee -pee jokes even though you stupid women don't get it. I found my stepdad's porn stash and he caught me. Is this shit over yet? Trolls are sad people. Why are they so mean to me? Trolls. People who troll on the internet sexy ass kid away from me so i typed in naked baby they were sexy fat people on planes are a safety hazard i will literally kill anyone who drives the speed limit did i mention people on the internet are mean to me but you'll never hurt my feelings i'm defensive because my feelings are easily hurt natural selection dog that uh, he said it! He said it! Don't go into the arena with me because I will win the war of words every time. Oh my god, this internet bullying bit goes on forever. You can't stop me from making fat jokes! I made fun of a fat girl because she started it by calling me a crybaby. You can't cancel me! Bitch, you can't cancel me! More fat jokes. Fuck these people, your social media is art. Okay, Jeanette Braun. Stroking his ego, stroking his ego. Mic drop. Sir, you are wildly insecure. Guys, it's bad. Like, it's it's terrible. I posted these Instagram stories while I was watching this special. I don't think I cracked a smile the entire time. Well, he made some stupid noises sometimes, so I may have let out a chuckle at those parts. Those chuckles were on par with me laughing at that stupid goofy sneaker thing from earlier. <laughs> this? is the worst excuse for a comedy show that I have ever seen. And I have seen some bad ones, trust me. <laughs> like this is easily the least fun I've had watching stand-up. It might just sound like I have a lot of strong opinions on the matter, which I do, but the vast majority of people who have watched Natural Selection, who also have access to an internet connection, share a similar opinion about the show. But don't take my word for it. Plenty of people who are more qualified than I am to define what is funny and what is not, have put these thoughts into much better words than I ever could. Comedian Anthony Jeselnik, who also has his own Netflix special, is a comic I had never heard of until now, but I watched some of his stuff and I have to say, he talks about some fucked up controversial topics, but his deadpan delivery makes them funny. Well, he had this to say when he was interviewed on the This Past Weekend podcast with Theo Vaughn. I think it's the most brilliant explanation of comedy and how it works that I ever heard. I'd like to play it for you now. But my thing was trying to make the teacher laugh. Because if you made a joke in class, teacher would yell at you immediately. But if you made her laugh or him laugh, then they couldn't get mad at you. And that felt so good. Because it was like you knew you did something wrong, but you did it in the best way possible. So now you're the star. Oh, that's fascinating. So it's like, how, do, how do you not get in trouble? People think like, oh, as a comic, your job is to get in trouble. And so, if, but they don't want to get yelled at. It's like, it's okay to make people mad, but they don't want any pushback. And I think that's wrong. Ah. As a comedian, you want to make people laugh. This is a quote attributed to Andy Warhol that I love. It's just, art is getting away with it. You know, if you put out a special Ooh. and everyone's pissed, like you didn't get away with it. You know, you need to make everyone laugh that they're like, yeah, he talks about some fucked up stuff, but we're all happy. Mm. That's art. Teacher laughed and I was like, oh, I'm not in trouble right now. I would have been, what's the difference? Oh, teacher laughed. And it was like, a, it was a stern teacher. It was like a strict teacher who like yeah. never laughed. It was like, oh, okay, if I can get her, I can do this. Perfectly put, you can get away with anything as long as you make it funny. What Matt Reif has managed to do in his stand-up is assume that he's funny enough to get away with saying whatever he wants when he's just not. I like the way this Vox article puts it into perspective. If you didn't know, Dave Chappelle, who I even regarded him as a respectable and funny comedian until his more recent controversies, but he's basically been canceled by the trans community for good reason. He's been waging war 
against transgender people for a few years now, and in one of his most recent specials, he makes jokes at the expense of Daphne Dorman, a trans comedian who took her own life in 2019. Dave says Daphne was a friend of his and ended the joke by saying, as hard as it is to hear a joke like that, I'm telling you right now, Daphne would have loved that joke. Okay, so one trans person that you knew personally would have laughed. So what? Clearly the vast majority of other trans people disagree with that. He used his token trans friend as an excuse to say whatever he wanted, but he didn't get away with it because it wasn't funny. Had it been funny, maybe the conversation would be different. I don't think any of us are saying that you're not allowed to joke about certain things. It just has to be funny. The author of the Vox article, Aja Romano, says this. There's no getting around the reality that transphobic rhetoric like Chappelle's absolutely contributes to real life harm. But Chappelle seems to view that hurt and even the immediate pain of his transphobic jokes as a worthy trade-off. Anyway, back to the whole Matt Rife thing. The initial outrage stemmed from a few different places. First of all, if you haven't noticed by now, Matt Rife's main demographic is women. Like the vast majority of his audience is women. The rest is made up of the LGBTQ community and then maybe like 5% tops of men. And most of those have probably been dragged to his show by their partners who are in love with Matt. So it seems like a thinly veiled attempt at trying to appeal to more of a male dominated audience. And he did that by essentially saying, lol, women no cook get punched in the face. The way women catapulted Matt Rife into popularity and the second he gets a comedy special on Netflix, he immediately betrays them with a joke about domestic violence crazy in it. Not Matt Reif building his platform on catering to his female audience and then opening his Netflix special with a domestic violence joke. The girls and gays were Matt Reif's biggest demographic and he used his Netflix special to pander to toxic masculinity. It feels like betrayal. I think Matt Rice's special is so bad because he's trying so hard to prove himself to other men through misogyny. It's desperate and sad. Got through about eight minutes of Matt Rice's Netflix stand-up. Typically his crowd work is phenomenal, but to open a comedy special with DV and pandering to frat bros, nuh uh, it wasn't funny. I mean, exactly. It's a prime example of someone becoming successful and then forgetting where they came from. And Matt knows it. He's admitted it all over the place. The problem is, in my opinion, he used women as a stepping stone to get to the boys club. And don't get me wrong, branching out can be a great thing, but as a career move, it makes zero sense why you would build your audience largely towards one demographic. And then once you become successful enough, you flip them the bird and say, Okay, I would like to do the exact opposite now. Thanks for the ride here. That would literally be like me building my platform, providing deep dives and commentary about MLMs, and then just going to join an MLM. <laughs> Who would ever do something like that, right? Right? Do you not like the thought that you have like a female base you want to be equal or? I'd love for it to be equal. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm incredibly grateful for women. Without women, I never would have like gained the momentum I did on social media. I'm so grateful for that. But in doing that, a lot of dudes didn't like that. I feel like my comedy is more for guys than it is women. Yeah, I watched it with my boyfriend and he was like a lot of the, like the, Humble brag. the <laughs> shit. Like he was like <laughs> dying at it. I'm like, I don't really get it. Women 100% are who pushed me to be where I'm at right mm -hmm. now. Like they gave me all the momentum on social media. I could never repay that. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, be because a certain amount of girls were supporting me, guys instinctually just went against it. Yeah. Like instinctually. It, if my girlfriend was obsessed with another guy, I would be like, this yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up until like April of this year, it was like 90% women coming to these mm -hmm. shows, which weren't always for the right reasons. And they got there and maybe they didn't like my comedy and they go, well, maybe I wasn't a fan for the right reason, which is fine. I appreciate the immediate support, but like yeah. I'm, I'm a comedian more than anything else. So like I'm, I'm going to do the comedy I want to do. I'm not going to pander to the, what right. girls want me to do. With so they bring their boyfriends or husbands who are always reluctant because they've and probably bought the tickets right they didn't want to be there and then like 20 minutes into the show they realized like my, my comedy is so much more for guys than it is girls it's so you funny see their me. shoulders like start to relax like oh the, yeah their arms like yeah. They're, they're drinking their drink more they're oh, yeah. another my, drink. <laughs> my live shows to me I, I've always gone for the tone of like I just wanted to feel like a hangout with the boys right. like mm -hmm. you're gonna say some ridiculous shit from time to time but I wanted to just feel like a hangout yeah. like I, I it it breaks my heart that so many guys just won't give me a chance because I'm like, dude, we, we'd pro we could be best friends. Dude. You just yeah. never know. So 
you want to attract a fan base who thinks that beating women is funny? Why would you want to surround yourself with people like that? Maybe I just don't get it because I'm not a dude, but I know plenty of men who don't think that shit is funny and wouldn't want to spend a singular second hanging out with Matt Reif. He said he wants to have a 50-50 split of men and women in his audience, so shouldn't his comedy appeal to basically everybody? <laughs> also, what about non-binary folk? Like that statement, he was already alienating part of the population, but anyway. If that's what your goals are though, your stand-up should be more appealing to a wider audience. So it makes no sense why he would pander to women on social media, which he objectively does, but then shit all over them once they spend money to come see him live. That is so beyond terrible. When the backlash started being hurtled towards Matt, he doubled down, as he historically has done in the face of controversy. His initial response did nothing to cool everyone off. Instead, he dug his hole way, way deeper by roping in another marginalized community into the outrage. Matt went to his Instagram story and posted one slide that said, if you've ever been offended by a joke I've told, here's a link to my official apology tap to solve your issue. And when the viewer clicked the link, they were led to a website that sold helmets for special needs people. Yeah. Matt Reif Logic 101. Tell an unfunny joke that offends 90% of my audience, which is women, and then instead of learning and growing, drag another marginalized group of people into this by being an ableist piece of garbage. Make it make sense. I don't get it. In what world is this the logical next step that's going to just make everything better? Now, the wildest part about all of this is that he's still actively on his problematic tour right now. So many people fought for tickets to this thing. If you're one of the people who were disgusted by his massage and ableism. Do you still go to the show? Do you sell your tickets? What do you do? Well, I can tell you what Matt does. He does what he does best. Bitch and cry about it on stage at his shows like he's always done. According to USA Today, in December he was performing in Florida, which maybe hints towards why he felt comfortable going off about this when and where he did. But the article says, Matt Reif kicked off a recent comedy show with an apology. An apology directed towards his energetic audience saying he was a little sick. Sick of, in kinder words those who can't take a joke on the internet. While performing a sold-out show at the Off the Hook Comedy Club in Naples, Florida, the 28-year-old comedian wasn't shy to address his controversies over the past few months. The Ohio native filled his audience in on what the last few months have looked like for him, but not before giving them a quick advisory before he truly tore into his set. And then the article quotes Matt as saying, I did want to make sure I mentioned at the top of the show though, if anyone here has come to a comedy show at a comedy club, with even the possibility of being offended by a joke, we have arranged a safe space for you. It's located right outside that exit door over there. Go and see yourself out. No one's gonna stop you. Ooh, he's mad, huh? Matt is also quoted as saying, some people thought I was making fun of special needs people, and obviously that's not what I was doing. I was making fun of critics for being so stupid as to think I would ever apologize for a joke. I'm saying you need those helmets way more than they do. Matt, has anyone ever told you that if you need to explain a joke, then it's not funny? <laughs> Can someone please tell Matt this? I'm pretty sure he's the walking personification of unfunny at this point. Which is wild because like he's told this story many times. But yeah, listen to the way he talks about why he almost quit comedy. Literally July of last year, I was considering quitting comedy. I, mean, I couldn't sell any tickets at any comedy club. I wasn't getting any kind of break. You were thinking about quitting? Yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, I I've been doing comedy for 11 years of as of last year. Um, ten of it in LA, and it's just it, it it beats you down hearing like so much rejection. Like I couldn't get a special anywhere, I couldn't get on a TV show anywhere. All of these things just weren't adding up. But after a certain point, you go, am, am I delusional? Like may maybe I'm not funny. Maybe I'm not supposed to do this. Matt, it's because your stand-up is not funny. He got famous off of improvisational crowd work, which is only bolstered by his good looks. He's not a good stand-up comic. He's not a good writer. He's a quick-witted fuckboy, and that's it. And the only reason people are paying. Him him now is because he got a lot of eyes on him through his crowd work clips on TikTok and suddenly producers saw that he has a market around him due to his viral internet success. And at that point, the producers don't give a shit if his material is actually funny. They just care that he can make them money. And he does. Because women on TikTok made him famous. I'm sorry, I told you I have strong opinions on this, but it is so obvious what happened here. And me and the girlies and the gays and the theys, we get it. The ones who don't get it are the same people that we've been trying to be heard by for centuries. Well, all of human history for that matter. People like... 
If you don't know anything about Jordan Peterson, I would suggest taking a minute to look up what this dude is all about. But so Matt Reif's next move was to go on Jordan Peterson's podcast called the Jordan B. Peterson podcast and essentially look for justification from another man. And I tell ya, nobody tries to uncancel the canceled harder than this guy. Jordan Peterson has faced cancel culture many times due to his own insanely problematic takes and just strange storytelling and behavior. She walked over to me with a handful of pubic hair compacted into something resembling a large artist's paintbrush. So because of that, he's decided to capitalize on cancel culture by platforming every person who ever faces internet backlash. This podcast is an hour-long circle jerk. It's just one big anti-accountability and anti-personal responsibility train sprinkled with their tears while they try to justify their shitty words and actions. Like, it's hard to watch because of how pathetic Jordan and his guests are. Let me just play the intro of this podcast for you. It's basically all you need to hear to understand what was discussed in the episode. It's a modern twist on an old joke, you know what I mean? It, yeah. was, it was a real circumstance that happened, an exaggerated yeah instance that really happened and I went you know this is this is a classic joke why not give my own personal modern twist on it and move on the jokes like a minute yeah, and 30 yeah. seconds that people were like all he did was bash women and I purposely did it first in the show to go hey just so you know this is this is the kind of humor I like to tell. And if it's not for you, you are so more than welcome to turn off the TV right now. And I mean, this is basically the entirety of anything Matt says the whole time anyway, because most of the episode is just Jordan Peterson pretentiously talking about nothing while Matt waits for his turn to speak. Well, and that's actually a phrase from evolutionary biology. Is I'll tell really? you a funny story. Well, it, 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 their strategy is sneaky. There are two variant male types of orangutan. I can remember too that when, when the Kentucky Fried Chicken came to town, orangutans tend to hang around in trees. They're arboreal. Yeah, oh, that's cool. So what way, huh, so, and they have these big fat pads around their face that are circular. The feminist male who's so on the side of women that, you know, he gets to be the friend who can entice some poor girl into bed when she's at her lowest point. Why would a guy go through all that trouble and pretend to be my friend just to sleep with me? I don't know. <laughs> But I've done it. Right. So right. pathetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why did you decide to come on my podcast? And for someone who calls himself a defender of free speech, Jordan really hates it when people practice their right to free speech when it's criticizing people that he likes, huh? I mean, they're acting like Matt, and for that matter, anyone who's been canceled, quote unquote, is being silenced. And they act like this on a podcast episode that has over a million views and Netflix left Matt's special up. It was front page on Netflix. That's hardly being silenced. All that happened is people on the internet said they didn't think the joke was funny. And yeah, some of them said it was an offensive joke alongside it being unfunny. And then Matt responded in the absolute worst possible way he ever could have. And he blew everything up for himself. Again, personal responsibility, accountability. We don't know her. The obnoxious part is that if Matt had just ignored it and moved along, this probably would not be as drawn out as it's become. If Matt could just learn to keep his bullshit to himself and not concern himself with us peasants of the internet, we'd all have moved on by now, guaranteed. He has said multiple times that he hates social media. At this point, it sounds like he just doesn't like being held accountable, and he creates an environment around him where people are constantly demanding accountability, but that's just how I see it. Vogue did an entire write-up on Matt where the interviewer asks him, You've said you dislike social media, where I imagine you encounter a lot of these comments. How are you handling internet trolls as your fame grows? Ooh, this is gonna be good. It's something I need to work on. I'm so immature. I have such a hard time not replying back. We live in a world where everyone has such a false sense of security and confidence hiding behind a computer screen. I have a huge problem with people not having to pay some kind of physical consequence. And obviously, because you're on a computer screen, I can't slap the shit out of you. But I can at least check you sometimes. 
I can roast you right back. I just can't let them get away with it. It drives me absolutely insane. Dude's got a pretty big problem with not being able to give women black eyes, huh? I mean, if there's anything that you should be taking from all of this, it's that Matt's true colors have really shown since his special came out. He has a pretty solid past of trying to convince us otherwise. For example, during the pandemic when he claims he developed an anxiety disorder, which if true, that's valid. That happened to a lot of people during the first few months. So about a couple months ago, um, developed this order. I had a massive panic attack. That was my third one I had ever had, but this one was just different. It didn't really leave. For days and weeks following, every moment of each day was just constant anxiety and fear that I couldn't describe. I didn't know what was causing it. I didn't know why it, would, why it wouldn't go away. The entire experience has been very eye-opening um, because I, I never quite took a lot of mental health issues serious, like such as, as anxiety. I figured like everybody gets anxious, everybody's nervous or worried or, you know, overthinking things, which I mean, I constantly am and have been my entire life. And those may be early signs of potential future anxiety disorders. I just never quite took it serious. Um, I figured people just, you know, weren't as mentally strong. And I realize now that I just how incredibly insensitive that is. Um, it is a real problem. I would not wish it on anybody in the entire world and it is to be taken serious. It's definitely just opened my eyes. It made me more empathetic to people who do deal with this on a daily basis. Just be kind because you don't know what somebody else is dealing with inside. I make fun of a lot of people. Now, had he utilized this new thought process during this current season of accountability, things would probably be different. I mean, how can you go from being able to admit you were insensitive and saying you have no idea what other people are dealing with to only a few years later shitting all over people who took you from a reality TV personality to selling out a world tour? You know what that tells me? It tells me that every time Matt has ever sat up there and tried to seem like a decent human being who knows what empathy is and even experiences it from time to time, it's just been for show. It's not even necessarily the misogyny and the ableism for me at this point, which obviously those things in and of themselves are enough to be like, yikes, I'm not gonna give that guy my money. But the true outrage for me anyway is just watching him hold himself the way he has. The cockiness, the circle jerking, the pity party, and the sheer fact that, let's be honest, this dude's career is only just beginning. While he certainly lost a large chunk of his audience that got him to where he is today, he found a new audience in misogynistic dude bros. And I'm sure he'd find a long-term bromance with Steven Crowder if he wanted it. Watch it. So you may be thinking, there's no way that this could get worse, but <laughs> it does. Because in the wake of all of this, Matt Reif came under fire for picking a fight with a six-year-old boy. On December 6, 2023, Bunny Hedea posted a video to her Instagram account, which has 212,000 followers, of her adorable son making a cheeky remark to Matt regarding a joke that he made on his Netflix special. Instead of giving you the play-by-play -play myself, I'm gonna just play the video that Bunny posted to her TikTok three days later, which has received over 15 million views now. Matt Reif has decided to start beef with my six-year-old child online. Yeah, you heard me correctly, my six-year-old child online. So my name is Bunny Hedea. If you don't know me, Hedea means gift. And this is my gift to you, reading Matt Reif to Phil. Like Matt, I have a full female audience online. Although I like mine. I don't want the men, you can keep them, please. I will gladly take your audience because we know you can't satisfy them anyways. This all started when his comedy special, which if that's what we're calling comedy, the things he said that weren't even funny were posted on TikTok and I started being tagged in them because everyone knows that my son is like a genius and he's really into space. I fiercely protect my child online. I'm not a family channel. People know his name, they know he likes space, they know he likes Minecraft, and that's pretty much it. Most people do not know any personal details about my child. And because of that, and because I have such a large audience, when I see people in person and when people see space clips, they tag me in them because they know that that's what he likes. This is the video that I posted. Nothing to do with the stars, man. Just because Jupiter has a ring and you don't, doesn't mean- Actually, it's Saturn that has the rings, and it has more also, and you're mean to girls. 
I am not the type of content creator that usually talks about other people or other things for views. I focus my content only on me because guess what, Matt? I'm interesting enough on my own, but I also didn't pay for my looks. So that's not really what people follow me for. If you look to the video on here, you can see that all the comments were like, oh my God, he's so smart, he's so cute. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, girl pack. you, he's not tagged in it. I have no connection with him and it was posted on a Netflix page. While you clearly took a lighthearted video and turned it into fighting with a six-year-old, let's talk about the comments that you said about me. This is my IG where he left the comment, okay? Do I look like I don't even show my body? For you to assume that every single woman online makes money by showing their bodies, which like, if that's what you do, girl, do you. Like, love it. I have never made a single dollar from a man. Audience is female, 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 female. And a little bit of the gays and nays. You can't accept the fact that people may like women for their personalities. No, you, we know you don't have one. You stick to circle jerking, the men that you need validation from, and I will gladly take your female audience that you so desperately want to get. No, it hurts because I'm richer than you. And I didn't have to pay for a Forbes article to fake it. And I really wish you luck on what's left of your career, but keep my child's name out of your mouth. We can he deleted his comment. What a little bitch. Y'all, y'all, what kind of person do you have to be to pick a fight with a literal six-year-old child? You are a grown-ass man. Um, Bunny absolutely killed it with this video. She mopped the floor with that pathetic little man, and she got a follow from me, so... But hey, that was just one mistake, right? <laughs> Wrong! Remember this kid? All I do is yeah, the Walmart yodeling kid, AKA Mason Ramsey. Matt Rive tried to start shit with him in 2018, right when the kid went viral for yodeling in the middle of a Walmart. So I don't know the context of this photo. I guess that's unnecessary. All you need to know is that Mason posted a picture of him with Post Malone to Twitter. And Matt, being the swell human being that he is, decided to comment on this child's looks. In this picture, you can see a slight texture on Mason's forehead. So Matt goes, fucks on your forehead some gum. Yeah, this is kind of a pattern of behavior at this point, right? That's rude to say to anyone, let alone a child. What goes on in this dude's mind where he thinks that this is A, funny, or B, a good idea, and then posts it publicly on social media? At this point, he was a grown-ass adult. He already had a bit of a reputation for being a pretty boy. How dare you talk about the way a child looks? Well, the happy ending here is that Mason won the internet that day, promptly replying with, it's a birthmark, not all of us are perfect. And Matt changed his tune fast, replying with, you are perfect, bro. Was just genuinely curious, lol. I've got your new single on repeat, little man. Keep doing big things. That's a bit of a tone shift from your first tweet, Matt. Almost as if you thought that you could bully him and he wouldn't respond. And if you were genuinely curious, DM him. Oh my God, why would you make a public spectacle out of this? The newest and latest updates on the hot mess that Matt Reif has created surrounding himself is that Tana Mojo and her podcast host, Brooke Schofield, spilled some serious tea about Matt that will probably be the final nail in the coffin for any woman ever wanting anything to do with him ever. So long story short, Brooke was dating Matt Reif, not exclusively, but Brooke says that it was more than just hooking up. In this podcast episode, you really feel for Brooke as she takes us through her relationship with Matt, how she knew the real him, how he was so supportive of him, and how she would travel to see him. Before I knew Matt, I like knew his per like his persona. It's like a fuck boy. That's his whole thing. That's his stage thing. Like, and so that's what I expected of him. When I got to know him and stuff, I was like, okay, wait, that's not him at all. I had my ideas of him, and then when I got to know him, I like really decided like that is not who he is at all. He's like a way like way better person than I would have thought. You know what I mean? Matt, he, I wouldn't say he was like my ex or anything because it wasn't like this serious relationship, but like it was more like I wasn't just hooking up with him. More so from his end, he was the one who was initiating the conversations that were like, you know, I haven't felt this way about anybody in so long. And like to anyone with like common sense, it's it's love bombing. So I was like, this guy's the fucking nicest guy ever. This guy's so hot. He's so nice. He's so attentive. Like I, I was obsessed with this guy. Yeah. Okay. And we were all on board for it. Until yeah. I had just, you know, flown across the country to go spend time with him and see all his shows and whatever. 
and then he comes to LA. Imagine my frustration. I'm like, how embarrassing that I just went like and did all of this. And then you come back and you can't even hardly spend time with me. It happened a couple times. He'd come to LA a couple times where it was like, I would only, you would go to dinner like once or something. And I'm like, wait, what? He tells me like, okay, like I'll see you after the show. I'll be over as soon as I'm done, whatever. I stay up all night, the man never comes. I'm just frustrated with the situation. I feel dumb kind of because I'm like, you're saying all of this, you're telling me the whole time like we're separated. It's like, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to be with you. Like I, you're all I think about, whatever. And then you're fucking literally outside my window and you can't go down to the mailbox. When they broke up, Brooke says that the conversation was respectable and she continued to support him from afar. And then when his Netflix special dropped and he got all that backlash, she talks about how she came to his defense because she knew that he wanted this more than anything. And she thought he was a genuinely good guy who deserved to have everything he's been working for. It was just like frustrating. So I, mm -hmm. I told him that and I was proud of myself because I like stood up for myself and I was like, listen, like that's not gonna work for me sorry and that was when like the conversation happened where he was just like i'm just, like i'm so sorry but i don't i do not have time like i don't for have time like no i don't have time for the relationship like i just don't and he's like i he told me he says i haven't felt this way about anybody in so long like i've and i've been dreading telling you because he's like i just wanted to keep doing it as long as i could but like i just i can't put energy into this like whatever the point is the conversation was so respectful and i i really do like gauge like how much how i feel about a man based on like how he handle handles like something like that and he was so sweet to me and nice to me and he like he hit all the points and he like made me feel like good about it so it's like i just respect him a lot yeah, go okay? on kill it and i've had that same like feeling about him all of this time i'm a silent supporter i've watched him from afar i like love to see like him be successful and like i was with him when his last special came out so to see him get a netflix special it was like huge yeah okay oh my god like this guy got like the one thing in the world that he wanted and everybody fucking hates it i just felt so bad for him because i'm like whether he's funny or not is up in the air but like he tries really hard and he works really hard and i actually did just feel so bad to see like his one thing that he got like just completely go that like as badly as it could go but i was on here like i'm like i love matt he he respects women like which is crazy <laughs> i was like i could because i really like I'm like, I feel that I have always felt that way about him. I really felt like he respected me like I did. Brooke had been defending Matt during most of this recent controversy on the podcast and people started throwing backlash towards Brooke and Tana for seemingly being Matt Reif apologists. Eventually, someone tagged Brooke in a TikTok that finally got Brooke to see the light. I am on TikTok the other day and I get tagged in a video of this girl and it's her and Matt. It's all these photos of her and Matt, like a little slideshow, if you will. I go to the comments and she had commented back to somebody and she was like, relax, you guys. This was at the beginning of this year. I go, hmm, because I was seeing him at the beginning of this year. I DM her and I'm I'm like, hey, like just wondering, honestly, like what was the timeline exactly? Just because like I'm, I'm curious because I mean, his current girlfriend was not long after me either. So I'm like, it had to have been around the same time. Immediately, she puts me into a group chat. There were timelines, there were Venn diagrams. We were comparing notes. It was so I crazy. see why you waited to tell me this. Yeah, absolutely. For a man who doesn't have time, this man had the most <laughs> oh, you're time. Fine. All of this time, I would see his billboard on Sunset. I'd be like, <laughs> like I was literally like his biggest supporter. And I've, I've been waving a fucking Matt Reif apologist flag for like all this time, like thinking like, oh, he was so good to me. Like my immediate reaction, just cause I'm me and I'm fucking stupid. I start gaslighting myself. I'm literally like, okay, well, you know what? Like maybe it wasn't as serious as I thought it was. Like maybe I just, maybe I thought it was like this huge serious thing and he didn't. Took only a couple scrolls, Tana, for me to get back to where he's telling me like, I don't want you to even look at another guy. I don't want anybody else touching you. I don't want you, he didn't want me hanging out with like my guy friends. Like it was so specific in that, like he was like, you're the only girl I want. I, he, we're talking about when we're gonna move to DC. I know, I know everything we just watched is the worst of the worst fuckboy behavior that I think we could have ever imagined. <laughs> I don't know much about Brooke, but she seems really sweet. And I believe that she genuinely just wanted to see the good in Matt. I give people the benefit of the doubt way more than I ever should. I have literally been told this to my face by my friends. So <laughs> I totally understand where she's coming from. It's a flaw I know I have and it's difficult to live with, okay? <laughs> However, this whole thing continues to get worse. 
hey, ladies, if you're angry now, wait until you hear what Matt Reif said on an episode of the Stiff Socks podcast, which first of all, bleh, there's a lot of audacity in this one. Buckle up. There were things that happened during that time that I just like wrote off as like not a big deal that I'm like, wait, what the fuck Stiff was wrong socks. with me? Talk Dude, about it before I, I fucking talk about shit myself on canceled. Matt Reif went on the Stiff Socks podcast with our baby Trevor Wallace. And I just want to say this is when I knew. I was still actively seeing him at the time. In fact, we'd gone to dinner the night before. He was telling me all about how he was going on a podcast. I'm excited to watch it. I'm like, oh, got to watch my man on a podcast. He's since had it wiped, (laughs) wiped from the internet. I wish I could wipe it from my memory. Trevor asking what his type was. His answer was blondes with fake tits. For the audio listeners, I am a brunette <laughs> with fucking real. T- they're huge, but they're real. What's your What's your favorite? Uh, like, who? What's your type of woman that's your favorite? That question was asked horrible, but you know what I mean. That's a very broad question. What type of woman is what, my favorite? What's your type? What's your type? Like your first and what's, your, what's your type? <sighs> I'm uh probably I don't blonde and curvy probably. I love, I love, I love, I love, I love fake tits for sure. That was like a little bit like a offensive, but again, when I knew he goes on to say that he is disgusted by Audi, like girls who have Audi because it looks like God left the tag on them. Oh, but sometimes you get a girl with a big clit and you're like, God, dude, I'm nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what am I supposed to fuck you or thumb wrestle? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, both, to, honestly. Uh, I don't, I don't love, I don't love a, a giant clit. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to look down and feel like, they're, like, like God left the tag on you. You know what I mean? Yeah, a little match. Like, 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 right. like I got a return to sender. Yeah, you know what I like, mean? It's a mattress thing. You can't take it off. Sometimes <laughs> it looks like they have a zipper on there. I have to like unveil a real bad bitch. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I just don't want your to look like the gum from uh, uh, Sausage Party. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. like the, the chewed one who was in the wheelchair. I'm going to give you guys the canceled exclusive here. But I, Brooke Schofield, have an Audi Okay. I've seen it. It's great. I have a fucking, and so does fucking two thirds of America. You fucking weirdos. Imagine me sitting there, my fucking jaw on the floor. You was, guys thought that was disgusting. The, the the public was like, oh my God, how horrible. Imagine how I felt. He literally just went on a podcast and was like, yeah, I'm fucking repulsed by this bitch. Quick side note here. When she says that he had this clip wiped from the internet, there is one living copy of the cooter shaming video clip and it's on some girl's TikTok where she provides commentary afterwards. Matt literally did try to wipe this thing off the face of the earth, but the internet never forgets. And also, I mean, we still have the full audio version of it, so I guess they didn't try that hard. And of course, Brooke decides to confront Matt, and then this happens. I go to send him a little message. And I wasn't even rude, I just sent him a text and I was like, how embarrassing is it that I'm literally currently getting dragged for defending you while also in a group chat with like seven other girlfriends you have? He blocked my fucking number. I was just gonna say, tell me the message is great and I'm blowing this house up. He blocked my fucking number. If you wanna see some heartwarming moments between Tana and Brooke regarding this conversation, I recommend watching the episode in full because this is the support women need from each other. And I'm glad that Brooke has such supportive friends in her life like this to be by her side when they're dealing with douchebags like Matt Reif. And finally in this episode, Tana confirms that Matt Reif facetunes his dick pics. I know, it's wild. Basically, on a previous episode, there's this bit where Brooke tells this story, but they censor out the dude's name, so no one really knew who they were talking about. Can I tell you something that I've never told anyone? Tana, you're going to die. And I've never told anyone this. I'm gonna start crying. Someone sent me a dick pic. I have seen this one a million times before. Okay, but this time, something, I don't know, I clicked it. Tell me why at the top it said Facetune in the title. I swear on my life. No. I swear to God. This man Facetuned his his dick pic. And he didn't even bother to change the title before sending it. Right the fuck now, bleep it, but I have to know. <laughs> <laughs> Swear to God. I have such secondhand embarrassment, I could throw up. What's so crazy about it is I saw it and I, I, like I was embarrassed for myself. Well, in this tea spilling sesh, Tana gives us confirmation that Matt Reif is in fact who they were referring to. First of all, if you're telling me that I cannot hang out with guy friends, you don't want me talking, hooking up with anybody else, then nobody in fucking Central America should be receiving a pic from you. I just, and that's just my thoughts, okay? A face tuned one at that. And, I, I, 
I'm like, I didn't say it. I'm just gonna leave you guys with that. Matt Rife facetunes his dick pics. Give yourself a moment to let that sink in. And considering everything we've discussed today, are we really surprised? Anyway, that's basically the end of the story for now. If I've learned anything about Matt Rife by making this video, it's that he is destined to find himself in hot water again. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, but he will find himself in more controversies time after time. Guarantee it. I don't believe that his career is over. I believe that he's going to go down a different path than what he was originally trying to go down. And honestly, if he wants to continue to be successful in comedy, he can. He's just gonna have to let go of that 50-50 split that he was talking about earlier. Women don't like you anymore, so good luck. <laughs> Thank you guys for making it to this point of the video. I just want to remind you of today's sponsor, June's Journey. You can download the game for free by clicking the link below in the description or scanning the QR code on the screen. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. So give it a shot. And finally, of course, I have to thank my patrons and my members. Also, thank you for putting up with my voice. I have been sick for like a week and I'm like, I have to get things recorded now. I can't put it off. Off any longer so sorry that my voice sounds all poopy but you made it here so I appreciate you anyway the list of names I'm about to name off are my financial supporters they get access to things like our private discord server we have a postcard club and sometimes even more than that so if any of that sounds good to you you can go to patreon.com slash Savannah Marie or you can click the join button beneath this video to join me on YouTube whatever platform you want works for me so with that the biggest thank you in the whole wide world goes to Hula Chowdown, Jacqueline Nutton, Kessie Drew, KJ Barnes, Leanne, Sarah Simi, Caroline Reed, Charlotte Treese, Daniel Rina, Maddie Darley, Ray, Turd Ferguson, Love to Be Evil, JJ, Martine Hubert, Amber Price, Baby Pink Pearl, Alice Wagner, Carol Campbell, LaSalle Story, Mother Dragon 82, Fallon Lowry, Hannah, The Best Elephant, Jessica Billhart, Emion, and Auntie Lou, and to the rest of my financial supporters, thank you so much for being here and for being you. And even if you're not a financial supporter, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I really appreciate you just being here. It helps my channel grow a lot. I hope you all had a fabulous holiday season and a safe new year and i'm excited to see what this next year brings for us here on this channel so thank you i appreciate you see you later bye